We just got through a week with uh, another Valentine's Day. Um, and so, you know, love was in the air. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, we're not going to talk today about love in the context of marriage so much, but the video, I think, really does a great job of talking about what God's love can do in people's hearts and the changes that love can make. Uh, so I want you to turn in your Bible. We're going to continue in our series in 1 John. If you brought your Bible, um, we're in 1 John chapter 3. If you didn't bring a Bible, grab one of the Bibles in the backs of some of the green chairs or underneath the blue chairs and use those or find 1 John 3 on your device, however you want to do it. And let me just again say, if you do not own a copy of the Word of God, the Bible, and you would like to, to have one, um, stop by the Welcome Center on your way out, and we'd be glad to give you a Bible. Um, be more than happy to do that uh, for you, with you. 1 John chapter 3. Everybody knows what a thermometer is, right? Um, I discovered what a thermometer is consciously where I began to understand it when I was probably four years old and I went to the doctor's office. I didn't like a thermometer when I was a little guy, you know. Um, and, you know, when, when the nurse came at me with one, I just kind of said, no, not again. Um, but we know what a thermometer is. And a thermometer is a, is a device, uh, whether it's used in a room, whether you stick it in a turkey on Thanksgiving Day, or whether it's placed in our body somewhere to see if we have a fever. A thermometer tells the temperature. It gives us the temperature. A thermometer doesn't change the temperature at all, does it? No. It doesn't set the temperature. It just simply says, this is what the temperature is at this moment. It shows warmth or coolness by degrees. John, in this passage today, he doesn't use the word thermometer. That's something I'm using. But he's essentially saying to us that God has designed a spiritual thermometer for us that shows whether or not we are walking as Jesus walked. Right? And that's what this whole series is about, being in fellowship with Jesus, walking with him as he walked. And John says there's a, some, a thermometer that God's got for that. And it's important, I think, as we go into this passage, as I said last Sunday um, in, in the previous verses in John, 1 John 3, that we don't lose sight of the theme of this letter. So many evangelical Christians, Bible-believing Christians and teachers will tell us that the theme of this letter is to show us, to give us assurance of our salvation, how to know whether or not we're saved. And it says you have this test and that test. It's not about that. It's not about relationship, giving us tests of relationship. It's giving us tests of our fellowship. And it's saying these things are going on in your life just to tell me, these are the thermometers, if you will, that I'm in fellowship with Jesus Christ. It's important that we don't forget that. Everyone who has believed in Jesus Christ, the Bible says, John 3.16 is a great verse. Everyone who has believed in Jesus Christ is in relationship with God. It happens the very moment you put your full trust and faith in him. And it can't be broken, that, that relationship. It's permanent. The Holy Spirit, John told us, moves into us. He says, you have this anointing from God. The Holy Spirit moves into us, inside of us. The moment we believe and he, he stays. But God wants more than just a relationship with you and me. And that's the greatest thing we have. But he says, let's take it farther. He wants fellowship. If you keep your place there in chapter 3, just back up to chapter 1. As he sets the stage for all this teaching that he gives the churches here in 1 John, this letter. Uh, verse 3, he said, "We what we have seen, and he's talking about Jesus Christ. What we have seen, we also, and heard, we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship along with us. 
He said, we, he's talking about the apostles, and he said, we saw Jesus. We walked with him. We talked with him. We heard him. We spent a lot of time with him. We have fellowship with him. We want you to have that same fellowship as well. Verses 6 and 7, still in chapter 1. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we're lying and not practicing the truth. He's talking again, and I'll say this again in the, in the course of the message. Do not lose sight of the fact that John is talking to Christians. All right? This is not a book written to unbelievers. It's written to Christians. And he said, if we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we're lying, we're not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And that fellowship happens and continues to happen. If you go over to chapter two, verse six, the last part of the verse, it continues to happen as we walk as he walked. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Now, we know that these people, as I said, that he's writing to are believers. So there's no confusion. They not might not be, quote unquote, true believers, as some people would say. And I'm not fond of that phrase, true believers. Why not? Well, either you are or you aren't. Okay. There's no such thing as a false believer. Okay. Either you're a believer or you're not. And he uses the pronoun we, and we just read it a few times in this letter, in over 40 verses in these five chapters, he says, we, 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 we. And in some verses, he uses it more than once. I didn't count. I, I, said, I said, I'm going to count the number of times he said. And, and I said, I'll just count the verses. And 40, over 40 of them. And that indicates that John's including himself in, in this conversation with these believers, doesn't he? He says, we, if we say we have fellowship. So he's including himself in what he's saying. And he calls these people Many times over, he calls them brothers, meaning we're in the same family. He calls them many times children, showing his affectionate love for these believers. And he says, as we saw last week in chapter 3, verse 1, now we are the children of God. So people, again, the people receiving this letter are Christians. But these Christians, just like you and me, who are Christians today, 2,000 years later, we can be out of fellowship with Christ, can we not? We can be. And maybe some of us are this morning. Uh, I don't know. I can't look in your heart and see. Um, I, I, was, I had the fun today. I said, well, I'm going to go stand out on the sidewalk and, and just say hi to people as they come in. And I wasn't standing out there so I could look at the demeanor of your face or, or, or you know, your expression or how you parked your car. Some of you ought to be glad that Christianity, that, that how you park your car doesn't determine, determine how, whether or not you're saved or not, right? <laughs> you know, there'll be like salvation. Okay, we need to try this again. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know, some of you may be from way out in the country, you know, and you're used to may, maybe gravel parking lots or whatever, those white stripes, they mean something. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> you make me feel very welcome this morning. I wasn't out there to look at you and determine whether or not you're saved. Right? That's not, I can't look and, I, I, can't, I can't, there's no way I can look at anybody this morning and say, I know you're saved. I can't, because why? I cannot see within your heart. I cannot see within your soul and your spirit, but God can. These Christians can be out of fellowship with Christ. In verse one, chapter 1, verse 6, he said, if we're walking in darkness, in other words, not walking with Christ, and we say we're in fellowship, John says we're lying. He said in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, I'm, I'm doing good, man. I haven't, it's been so long since I sinned. Well, you just told a lie, all right? <laughs> If we say we have no sin, he said we're deceiving ourselves. And then he goes even farther in verse 10 of chapter 1. It says if we say we don't have any sin, not only are we deceiving ourselves, in verse 10 he says we're calling God a liar. And it just kind of proves the, the point that, you know, we're, if you're Christian, your sins have been washed in the blood. We read that, but it doesn't make us perfect. Will we ever become perfect? 
Well, let's go back to what we saw last week. Will we ever become perfect? When we see him, we will become what? Just like him. All right, but that day's not here yet. All right, in heaven, we will be perfect is what that's saying. So don't say we'll never be. Oh, yeah, we will. And that's our hope. We look forward to that. Ladies, aren't you excited that one day your husband will be perfect? The bad news is the Bible tells us in heaven there's no marriage, no giving in marriage, so you won't be married anymore in heaven. You just have to deal with it, all right? <laughs> this man that I, I tried so hard to straighten out all those years, and he couldn't get perfect, and then boom, in the twinkling of an eye, he's perfect, and we're not married anymore. <laughs> I don't know where this stuff is coming from. It's not in my notes. <laughs> So John goes on to explain that I can be in this relationship with Jesus that came when I believed in him, but at the same time, I can be out of fellowship with him because of my own sin. I'm still Christian, but when I'm out of fellowship, I'm out of sorts with Christ because here's the deal, and we saw this in the first chapter, he can't have fellowship. He can't walk with us when we're in darkness. He can't. He doesn't fellowship with me when I've got unconfessed sin. So to regain that fellowship, in chapter 1, verse 9, John gives the remedy. He says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In fact, Jesus, our advocate, he says in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, our our defense attorney, is pleading our case. Every time we sin, he stands before the Lord and says, let's look at the cross. And on that cross, Father, I died, I shed my blood to pay for Rick's sin. That he just did. It's paid for. He pleads our case. And the great thing about Jesus, our advocate, is he's never lost a case. He always wins. <laughs> yeah, he never, never loses. We saw last Sunday that our position in Christ is one of being God's child. Now we are the children of God of God. It's a position we said last week. Remember we talked about position, where we stand. It's a position of being righteous, righteous because Jesus is righteous. It's not based on our performance. It's based on Christ's perfection. All right. That's easy to remember, isn't it? Not my performance, his perfection. It's what our righteousness is based on, our position. But there's another part of our relationship with God that impacts our fellowship with him, and it's not our position. It's another P word. It's our practice. Our practice. Our position is fixed, meaning it cannot be changed. We are righteous in God's eyes. But our practice, what I do every day with my life, how I live my life, is that fixed? No, because our lives oftentimes are like roller coasters, you know. It's not fixed. And that's what determines our fellowship. Our position determines our relationship, or our relationship determines our position, probably. Our fellowship is determined by my practice, whether or not I'm walking with Christ and in the light or whether I'm walking in the darkness. Today he continues that theme of position and practice, and he lets us know what matters most in our walk. What's the most important thing? And that is that we are demonstrating the supreme character of Christ by loving others. Let's um, read some scripture. First of all, in your notes, God places a high value in love. I'm going to start reading verse 10. Chapter 3. This is how God's children and the devil's children are made evident. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one, you might circle that word especially, especially the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. Again, let me ask you, those of you who've been here, been listening, paying attention, thing is sticking, the beginning means means what? Somebody tell me. What's that? When we were saved, when you first heard the gospel, he's not talking about the beginning, Genesis 1.1. Should, it's, it's that way. He's not talking about the beginning, Genesis 1.1. He's talking the beginning of your relationship with Christ. You've heard this from 
the beginning. We should love one another. Where did John hear that? Someone tell me. So, yeah, it's not hard. I'm mean, not a trick question. You heard it from Jesus, didn't he? Did Jesus say that? A bunch of times. We've heard this from the beginning. We should love one another. Unlike Cain, Cain, the brother of Abel, the two sons, first sons of Adam and Eve. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him, John asks? Because his works were evil. Talking about his sacrifice that he made supposedly to God, his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers. Again, he's talking to Christians. If the world hates you, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. He calls them children. Children, hear me, or or a child of when he says in verse 10, God's children, the devil's children. The word children um, is not in the Greek. A child of is not in the Greek. What John is saying is that when we sin, that sin cannot be traced. Hear me. When you and I sin, that sin can't be traced back to God. It can't be traced to the new divine nature that comes with salvation. We can never say, and I've heard this said by Christian people, why why did you do that? Well, I can't help it. That's how God made me. Tracing our sin back to God. No. God didn't make you to do sin. Right? God didn't make you sin. We can't trace it back to God. Instead, it's part of the old fallen nature that we talked about last week. Before who I was, before I was Christ, that's dominated by the devil before we trusted Jesus. And once again, we see the proof here that Christians, we can live like we're not Christians. And then John tells us the biggest, most evident way that we do live like Christians, and it has to do with love. So if we're going to talk about love this morning, let's define it first. The love that John describes is something that we learn from Christ. We don't have to look any any farther, John says, than to look at Jesus. Look long and hard, as we talked about last week. Next Sunday, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. Look long and hard at the cross. The love in this passage, the word he uses here, and again in the Greek language, the word love can be found in three or four different words. This is the one word that's different from anything that we, that anybody else can experience on earth. It can only be experienced by by people who put their faith and trust in Jesus, and that's a Greek word, agape, but it means God's divine love. It's not human affection, it's not friendliness, it's not kindness, it's not romantic love, it's not the love that I have for my children not family love. Those are all different words in the Greek. It's divine love. It's the same love that Jesus demonstrated when he gave his life for us. That's what Paul writes in Romans. This is how God demonstrated his love. Christ died for us. It's loving others, this kind of love, is loving others as Christ loves us. And people who don't know Christ, think about it now for a second. Can people who don't know Christ, I mean atheists, pagan people who don't believe in God at all. Can they be kind? Can they be affectionate? Sure they can. We all know really nice people who are not Christians, don't we? I do. They can possess the brotherly love of family. And I can show you kindness and affection and brotherly love myself. I can show you those things and still while I might be out of fellowship with Christ. You see, just because I'm not walking with Christ doesn't mean I can't love. I can love, but not with this love. Can't practice this kind of love that only comes from God unless I'm in fellowship with him. But this divine love is a big deal. God says this is really, really important. Paul concludes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You all have read it. You've heard it recited at weddings, which it really isn't a wedding marriage passage, but it's a great passage on love. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. He concludes, he ends the chapter with these words, 
verse 13. Now, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So in God's eyes, the greatest action, the greatest thing that we can do as Christians is loving others. That is what he puts the premium on. When we're loving to others, what is it? It's a sign, John says, that we're living what we say we believe. When we're walking as Christ walked, when we're following closely behind him, we're going to begin to love like Jesus loved. And know where John says this love, and he uses the word I asked, I told you, you might want to circle that word, where John says this love especially shows up. That was the word he used. Shows up within the community of the church because he said, especially the one who does not love his brother. Well, who's my brother? Who's John talking about here? Now, I I'm, I'm come from a family. I, there are five siblings in my, in my family. I'm the oldest. Someone asked my sister last night, how much older than I was she? It's not talking about my sister and my three younger brothers here. He's talking about, who's he talking about when he says brother? He's talking about those of us who are the children of God, those in the family of believers. Look around you and see your brothers and sisters. Then echoing Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, John tells us that if we hate our brothers, it's the same as moral murder. And he uses the example of Cain, didn't he? Cain is John's example. Cain killed Abel because of jealousy. Cain and Abel, Genesis chapter 4, were the sons of Adam and Eve. And in an effort to worship God, Abel's sacrifice, he shed blood, killed an animal, a, a lamb. Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God. Cain's, he brought him some, some corn, was not. And one of the great errors we can commit in the church is when we do what Cain did with Abel. When we so look around and see your brothers, when we look around and we begin to compare ourselves to one another. It's one of the great errors. And when we often, what happens often when we do that, we begin, we can always look at some, here's the thing. I can always look at somebody who's doing better than me. And if I, if I do that, It tends to make me feel inferior. But I can also always look and find somebody who's not doing so good either, and I can make make me feel better than them. Can I not? We feel inferior sometimes to someone who seems to have his or her spiritual act together when maybe we don't. And while it's healthy, Paul talks about this, it's healthy to look to others who are walking with the Lord and to learn from them other people, there's no, nobody in this room is your standard or mine. Our standard is Jesus. And so if we want to do some comparisons, the writer of the Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, if we want to compare ourselves to anybody, compare yourself to Christ. Then when, we comp- when I compare myself to Jesus, I'll just speak for me. You want to be humbled? There you go. Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for who? One another. Disciple to disciple. He said, this is how the world will know you love each other. Here's what Jesus was saying. The world is looking and the world is watching to see, Nag said church, if we genuinely love each other. Why? Because even those who don't know Christ at least believe Jesus was a teacher. And one of the things I believe he taught was love. And if we claim to be following him, walking as he walked, we should be loving as well, should we not? That's what he means in verse 15 when John writes and says, this is how we know we pass from death to life because we're loving each other. We're practicing what we preach. It's showing I'm not living in that old nature. I'm practicing the life of the new nature. We're practicing what we preach. And as Jesus said, it will be evident to others. The opposite of love 
is hate. And John tells us not to be surprised if the world hates you, you believers. Don't be surprised. We live in a, we ought to be living in a countercultural way. Because the world, remember the first, we were in 1 John 2, and he said, don't love the world or the things that are in the world, the love of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Don't love that because the world will say to everybody in the world, go this way. And the Christian is saying, no, we'll go that way. On so many things, Jesus said the same thing. It's where John heard this. We say, I'll go with Christ. Jesus said in John 15, 18 through 19, if the world hates you, he told these disciples, would the world hate them, by the way? Most of them got their heads cut off or got crucified or got burned or what boiled in oil. These guys, <laughs> that's, that's hate. If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, the world hates you. So then John says, so love, it's the, it's the main thing. So love next demands action. We, we just heard a great song. Love is a verb. Love demands action. Verse 16, this is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. That's the great example. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, but closes his eyes to his need, how can God's love reside in him? Little children, we must not love with word or speech, but with truth and action. You know, it's easy, easy to say the words, I love you, isn't it? Isn't it? And everybody look at me and repeat after me. I love you. <laughs> it's easy to say the words, but the kind of love that shows up in our lives a life that's lived for Christ isn't about words, it's about action. But when it comes to putting sacrifice and generosity into practice, especially for someone, listen to me now, we're talking about Christian people here, especially for someone you may not know or you may not care very much for. It's not natural to sacrifice for them to give up for them. Yet John says, if we see a brother or fellow Christian in need and we have the means to help them out, yet we refuse. We're not displaying true love. I, I love to hear, and that's at church for our, we have a lot of guests today. Our parking lot, by the way, this morning is full. We're parking along the street. Um, and that's fun. So we have a lot of guests. It's a holiday weekend. Uh, we have connection groups in our church, our small groups. And, um, and they meet all over the community and all kinds of times and places. Um, and I love to hear about our connection groups ministering to those in their groups who might have a need. I get blessed by that when I, when I hear about that, when I see that. Whether they're providing them with a meal, whether they're helping make a repair on their car or their home. Uh, we, we have a benevolence fund that we... Every time we have communion, we do a special offering, and the money goes into that fund to help people with those kinds of needs. And that's primarily put into this practice of loving one another. You see, we can't close our eyes to the needs of our brothers and sisters. And that speaks out loudly to the world about our loving God. So it's more than words, whether they're spoken, whether they're on a card. Did you get a card on Valentine's Day? Or maybe in a text. Love demands, divine love demands that we do something. And often when we do something with this kind of, of love as our motivation, the world watches that and they go, why? Why are you willing to give your money, your hard-earned money, 
to, to that cause, to that person, for that purpose, that reason. Why, why? Why are you willing to give up your time? Why are you willing to give up your Saturday to go and work in somebody's house or whatever it might be? Why? It's beyond a natural response. It's supernatural. And that's why they don't get it. It's They don't have inside what it takes to live this love out. It's supernatural prompted by the Holy Spirit. So John says, I can know I'm walking with Jesus when I move to action to meet someone's needs. And if I'm doing nothing, I see somebody has need and I don't do anything, I need to go back to chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. If I say that I'm in fellowship, if I say that I'm in fellowship, and here's what I do if I'm not in fellowship, I confess my sin and restore that fellowship. Loving with God's love is, is more than really liking someone. In fact, you don't have to, let's just be, let's be honest about that. You don't have to like someone to love them with divine love, do you? You don't. You know, I don't like you, but I sure do love you. <laughs> I wouldn't say that to anybody, but, you know, that's kind of the truth. We're even told by Jesus to love our enemies. You know, you've read the Sermon on the Mount. Read aloud with me, Matthew 5, 43 and 44. It's up on the screen. Read that with me. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Hey, you know what? That's not normal. Normal is what you've heard before, Jesus said. But that's a great description of our lives when we're in fellowship with Christ, when we're walking as we walked. Because when we are, listen to me, Christian, this is what separates the men from the boys in Christianity. Or I don't want to leave you ladies out, the women from the girls, if you want to say it that way. This is what separates us, is that we're able to do that. And we're able to do that because it's not normal. And what that says to me is, we're not normal. Look at the person next to you and say, you're not normal, all right? Some of you got a great kick out of that, you know. I've been wanting to tell her that for a long, long time. Okay. And I did it in church because the preacher told me to, so. Next point. Jesus' love is such a high bar to reach. Oh, that's not easy doing what we're talking about here. Verses 19 and 20. This is how we will know we belong to the truth and will convince our conscience in his presence. Even if our conscience condemns us, that God is greater than our conscience and he knows all things. So I'm supposed to love like Jesus loved. Let's be honest. That's raising the bar really, really high, isn't it? And it's raising the bar so high that I look at that and say, Oh, I fail at that so many times. I feel so guilty. That's our conscience speaking to us. I'm not so sure, Lord, that I'm ready to die for someone else. And that's what you said this kind of love involves. Maybe giving up my life. I'm not so sure I'm ready to do that. Not yet. Is that what I have to be committed to? Is And if it is, God, I can't say that I can do that. And so... We feel a sense of guilt. I, I promise, I know Jesus, I promise that I, I, I'm going to walk like you, but I don't think I can. So we feel like we've failed, do we not? But John says, and this is in your notes, God is greater than my conscience. He said, God's greater than your conscience. He knows my heart. He knows if I want to follow him. He knows if I'm committed to the truth. He knows. After Peter denied Christ three times, remember the story? After Jesus' resurrection, they were out on the, on the beach having a conversation there in Galilee, and Jesus pulls Peter aside. Come here, Peter. And he asked him a question. He said, Peter, do you love me? In fact, he asked him that three times. He denied him three times. Three times Jesus said, do you love me? And Peter replied, John 21, 15, Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. You think Peter was feeling guilty for 
denying Christ? Do you think so? I'm sure he beat himself up every day, all day long over that. But he said, I know you love me. God's conscience is greater than your guilt, than your failure. Are you committed to truth and to loving others? You say, I really think I am. He knows that. Don't beat yourself up if you're not quite ready to be crucified today for somebody else. Okay? It's when you do beat yourself up that you might give up. And he doesn't want you to give up. Right? Next point, a clear conscience impacts my prayers. Verses 21 and 22. Dear friends, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God and can receive whatever we ask from him because we keep his commands and do what is pleasing in his sight. Let's make this real simple. And John is, again, he remembers hearing Jesus say this. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Did Jesus say that? Yep. When I'm walking as Jesus walked, when I'm living in this divine nature, when I'm in fellowship with him, when I'm loving Others, I have this holy boldness to pray. Why? Because I know I'm, best as I can tell, I'm keeping his commands. I'm having regular conversation with him. I'm asking him for things that please him and are in his will. I'm praying confidently. Do you wonder how it is that some people, we know people, you know people like this. Do you, why is it that some people they pray and things happen. You know people like that? You do because whenever you have a prayer need, you say, I'm going to go to so-and-so first because I know they're going to pray and I know God listens to their prayers. They don't just talk to him when they're in trouble. They talk to him all the time. Why? Because they have confidence that they can talk to him and he hears them. They don't start out their prayers. Have you ever done this? They don't start out their prayers something like this. Excuse me, Lord. Can I interrupt you for a second? They don't start their prayers out that way. They pray to God confidently as the writer of the to the Hebrew says, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Then lastly, obedience puts me in fellowship with him. Verses 23 and 24. Now this is his, Jesus' command, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, or God's command, excuse me, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he, Christ, commanded us. Did he command us to do that? Yeah. The one who keeps his commands remains in him. There's another term for fellowship that John uses. It doesn't mean relationship. It means fellowship. It's talking about our practice, not our position. Remains in him and he, God in him, And the way we know that he remains in us is from the spirit he has given us. John is saying, do these two things and you got it. Believe in Jesus, love one another. He says, you know, we talk in Nags Head Church, we have what we call the big three. We tell, we, and we have a bunch of new partners coming into our church right now and, and we talk to them about the big three. Here's kind of what we expect from all of our partners, you're here on Sunday, faithfully, consistently. Secondly, that you get involved in a connection group. You plug into a small group that meets throughout the week for Bible study and prayer and fellowship. And then number three, that you hook up with a ministry team and have a consistent, regular ministry to one another in the family of Christ. We call that the big three. God's even simpler. He says, big two. Of course, if you do those two, then those other ones are going to come out of that, I believe. But he says, believe in Jesus, love one another. That's it. It's when we're living disobediently that, you know what happens when I live disobediently? Doubts pop up in my mind. The devil whispers in my ear. You really don't believe, do you, Rick? You're doubting God. I didn't think you were a believer either. I think you've been fooling yourself. He whispers in our ears, 
and we wonder. And it's when we're not walking as Jesus walked, we're also not listening to the Holy Spirit who is inside of us, the anointing, he said. And like Eve, instead, we begin listening to the serpent, whatever that might be in my life. Look at the words, he says, in verse 24, he said, we, we know. This is the way we know. How do we know? Well, because we're doing the right things. No. That's not how we know. Although doing the right things is the one way to keep from doubting. Obedience says to Jesus, I love you. But we know we're truly believers by the presence of the Holy Spirit, he says, in our lives, in us. Hear me now, because I know that some of you come from backgrounds where you, where, where you were told was exactly the opposite of what I'm going to say. So I'm glad to straighten you out. Can we feel him in us? No, I don't think so. But if you go to Galatians chapter 5 and you see what we do when we're walking in righteousness, those things are evident in us. When we walk in the Spirit, let me turn there to Galatians chapter 5 and just read that real quickly to you. It's a passage that I believe you're familiar with. Galatians chapter 5. If you want to take a time, take a moment and turn there. It's somewhere in your Bible in between Matthew and and Revelation. Galatians Galatians chapter 5. If you're using one of the Bibles in the chair, it's on page 1075. For the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. The works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar covers a lot of stuff. I dropped to verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, here's how you know the Spirit of God's living. Here's, here's the fruit that grows on that tree. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The Holy Spirit. And did you notice that the fruit of the Spirit starts with What? What's number one? Fruit of the Spirit is love. Top of the list, God says. It's the main thing. Love is indeed the thermometer of our spiritual health, of our fellowship with Christ. Christians express the love of God and show by doing so that we have passed from death to life in our experience by opening our hearts to brothers and sisters in need. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord God, I pray that you will take what we've heard this morning and use it to mold us and make us into your will. I pray that you'll change our hearts today. For those of us who are Christians, may we realize my, per- my position is in your righteousness, and that's based on Christ's perfection. But my practice is what determines my fellowship. Keep that in mind all the days of our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.